Hey guys, Mike Roberts, the Converse Cowboy Podcast. Um, coming to you from the Hidden Valley Ranch. You know, this is a little bit different than our typical show. We, you know, we typically go on the road one week out of the month, but due to the coronavirus, we're um, stuck here in quarantine. So, uh, Matt Cook called in today, and and we had a good conversation about the working cow horse. I mean, he is a Matt Cook is a household name in the in the NRCHA, four time AQHA world champion. Um, he won one fifth and six last year in the snaffle bit won six at the world's greatest. So he's doing some really cool things and, uh, just a, a great guy. And, uh, you'll see that throughout this episode, you know, what makes Matt cook, what he is. He's a very genuine, authentic guy. The definition of a cowboy, you know, I mean, he is living the lifestyle. He's in Colorado now doing his own thing, him and his wife and, and kids and, uh, it you know the conversation goes from family to business to horses to training to everything that it takes to do what he's doing so i think you guys will enjoy the show so check it out So we're here at, at my place called the Hidden Valley Ranch, and uh, got my producer Steve-O with us, and uh, we're in the bunkhouse, so named after the Yellowstone. There you go. Can you watch it? I haven't. No, I've heard all about it. I've never even turned it on. Oh, man. You got to get into it. I don't have TV. I don't have, you know, uh, TV of any, any kind, but I do watch that stuff on netflix or whatever so we'll just we'll kind of dive into it like i said it's just going to be a conversation and, and this show is really about tapping into the mindset um psychology philosophies that you have with horses and in life you know i mean this thing this whole thing that you guys do is not a horse hobby it's a horse business so i want to see what makes you guys tick and why you do what you do i did listen to the podcast that you did um what is it full contact uh-huh yeah man that was a really cool i, I thoroughly enjoyed that well, good. Yeah, it was a really cool, cool episode, and and I enjoyed hearing your stories. I didn't realize you were from Kansas, though. Yeah, I grew up in farmer country. What part? What 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 town were you from? Uh, uh Seneca is the northeast part. Okay. It was about ten miles from miles from Missouri. I went to school. I went to a ju- junior college up there and played baseball in uh, Barton County. You know where that is? Yep. And and I heard you went to Lamar, right? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, did. So I don't know. I'm trying to remember if they were in our conference, Jayhawk League or not, but I know we went to Lamar and played over there. That is a windy son of a bitch over there, man. Yeah, that is a terrible place to yeah, to live, I would think. It was okay for two years. Yeah. Yeah, I don't plan on going back. No. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about Definitely. your time there? How did you end up over there? So I um, I wasn't planning on going to college um, in high school or anything like that. I was just farming and stuff like everybody does back there. Right. And then I seen an ad in Western Horsemen. Had an ad for Lamar Community College where you go ride horses and whatnot. And I was like, well, shoot, that sounds like a good way to maybe go to school. Yeah. So we gave her a whirl. Were you riding, you were riding Bronx at the time? Mm-hmm. Yep, I was riding Bronx at the time and roping and so it just all fit in. and I'd never really even been away from home. I mean, shoot, two hours from home is probably the farthest, the farthest I've ever even been. Yeah. Loaded all my stuff and drove eight hours away and was like, well, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it was anything like Barton County, I mean, we we played baseball and drank beer and went to house parties. I mean, was it was it any different over mm-hmm. more? About the same? No, no. We rode, we practiced riding Bronx three days a week. We team roped five days a week. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then you just partied at night. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I think that was probably my favorite time, my, probably my best year of my life. Like, I was flat broke, you know, but I was doing something I loved and <laughs> and just enjoyed the hell out of it. No, that's it. That's what I say. I kind of opened my eyes and let me see what the heck else was out there in the world. I didn't even like say I didn't this stuff. We had to do horse training and stuff. Yeah. Did, did so did did um you were just riding Bronx there. Did you did you have any exposure to any horse shows or working cow horse or anything like no, that? No. No. So what it was they had a colt starting program there. Um 
horse training and management. And so you got a two-year-old to start the first semester, I think, or the first two semesters. And then I think the third semester you got to bring an older horse or they gave you an older horse and then you picked a discipline to kind of study or whatever. And then the last uh, semester you went on an internship. And so that's, like I say, I think I rode them colts and then I can't remember what I, I did for specialized. I think I did the cutting maybe or something like that. And then they sent me to Lloyd Cox's on my internship. Pretty damn good place to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. It was, like back then, I didn't even know who Lloyd Cox was or even what a cutting horse was. Yeah, what year was, was that, man? I didn't have a clue. That would have been 05, probably, 04, 05. Okay. I'm curious, where did those two-year-olds come from, the ones they gave you to start? So, like, the two-year-olds that I was riding at, like, at Lamar, they were just kind of some cult, I mean, ranch horses and stuff. Mm. Um, but, like, when I they sent me to Lloyd's, I mean, I showed up there, and they're like, well, here's 32 head, get started. <laughs> and the first one I started was Hip Adams, horse that Boyd won, Boyd Rice won reserve on its snaffle bit. Mm-hmm. Um, he was the gentlest, kind of biggest one in there, so I started him, and then that was my snubbing horse for the rest of them wild little dual ray yeah. red things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. So, so, yeah, that was kind of my introduction. Yeah, how, tell me what those days were like. I mean, what time were you getting to the barn? I mean, if you had 30, what would you say, 32 head? Yeah, 32, yep, yep. And like they said, just get started. And so, oh, we'd get, I think we'd start around 7 because they had a barn crew that fed and, and did everything, clean stalls, so all we had to do was ride. And so I'd get there, and I mean, I didn't know anything about it, so I'd get about 8 colts started a day, I guess. And then once I had them all kind of going, well, then I could ride, I don't remember, 12, 15 a day or whatever. And then once they were gentle enough, I could handle them, hand them off to the other guys. They took the gentle ones, and then I just kind of kept the wild ones. That's how I spent that three months. That's what I was going to ask. So you did have some help um, as far as being able to hand those, those, those ponies off to other folks after you kind of got them going? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Lloyd had some assistance. Um, like Jamie Snyder was working for him at the time. Um, uh, all their kid named Andrew Speaks was there, Justin Finney, and uh, Ronald Cameron. They were all there working for Lloyd at the same time. So they'd kind of just divvy them colts out once I had, oh, 10 days, two weeks on them. And they'd kind of take their picks. Did you get any uh, any hands-on lessons from Lloyd or any, any words of wisdom throughout the... No, I... Not really. I mean, I was kind of out in my bronc pen area, and I'd go from the bronc pen and open the gate, and it was just some big old flat open country up there where Lloyd lived in Fort Morton, sand, and I'd just go out and ride them out in the pastures. Like, I hardly ever seen them guys even work horses. Yeah. Um, I think they put me on one non-pro horse to work on the flag one time, and and that was it. <laughs> um, otherwise, I was just a crash dummy. To back up a little bit, I mean, other than starting those those colts at, at Lamar, had you started many colts, you know, before that? I, I mean, I know you said you grew up in a, you know, from a farming background, but uh, were you around horses from an early age? Yeah, from an early age, my grandpa traded horses. Okay. Um, and so we always had horses around. And then those farmers would hire us, um, my dad and uncles and I, to gather wild cattle for them back there in that country in the brush. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of was our start. I mean, we had those horses around to kind of help just gather wild cattle. And then we did the team pin and deal some. And, and then I think like in eighth grade or something like that, I thought I wanted to start starting colts. And so a few people would send them to me and then I'd buy a bunch of traders um, and then just kind of start them colts and then resell them and, and just kind of learned that way the, from trial and error. Right. So when while you're at Lloyd's, do you have any direction as tr- as far as wanting wanting to go? I know you said you were somewhat gravitating towards cutting, but did you have any idea about working cow or anything like that? No, I knew they like we had a little introduction in college about the cow horse deal, um, but not much. Um, 
and kind of like my first introduction to the cow horse deal is was Lloyd's farrier, uh, Russell Speaker. He uh, showed some of the cow horse and stuff like that, and he was a good cowboy and, and all that, and so I really looked up to him. And uh, so he kind of showed me. He turned the horse around one time for me and this and that, and I was like, holy cow, that's pretty neat stuff. Yeah. And then I can't remember. Then I think I started entering some ranch horse competitions, and that was kind of the the kind of the start of the cow horse deal, like RHA stuff there me. in Texas. Yeah, yep. Played in R. Yep, yep. Showed in the RHA um, a lot when I worked for um, I worked for Robbie Boyce for a while, and we'd go on the weekends and show on some of that. And then um, when I worked for Haythorns, we went to a lot of RHA shows. Yeah, I remember seeing you the first time. We used to go to that stock show every year in uh, Fort Worth. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. I was like, look at this punchy son of a gun, you know? And that was, I guess, whenever you were first starting out, and uh, you caught my attention, and everybody that was with me, you, you damn sure yeah. have a, a unique style, you know? So the name Matt Cook stuck, stuck yeah, in my head. That's funny stuff. But yeah, no, I just, like I say, I don't know. Like, I always just kind of admired the California style or whatever, and just kind of the places I work, you just kind of pick up little things here and there. And, yeah. I mean, just, and just roll with it. Can you tell me, you mentioned uh, Robbie Boyce, um, for folks that may not know, mm-hmm. can you tell me a little bit about him? Yeah, so he grew up in, I think it was Washington State, um, and then his dad was a horse trainer, um, and then Robbie worked for, I think, Avila and stuff like that in the cow horse deal. And then he worked for Carol Rose for quite a while and showed cow horses. Um, he's working for Callens at the moment and kind of showing more cutters for him now. But, but I mean, he was, I mean, really good in the cow horse deal. And like I say, somebody I kind of always, I looked up to, like I say, especially once I went to work for him and stuff like that. And just really good family and people. So, so from, from there, from, you went to Haythorns, was that the first big ranch you worked on? No, I managed a place, not a huge place. I managed to, oh, I don't know what we ran, five or six hundred head a year. It had been Jamie, dad, Larry there, you know, we were about 45 north, miles north of Lloyd's there in Colorado. Uh, it was kind of my first ranch job. Um, and then I went from there, you know, I went to California for a while, then Robbie Boyce's, and then, yeah, Haythorns was my first big, big ranch job I had. Now, were you just riding show horses there? Were you just over the horse program? Or, at Haythorns? Or, yeah. No, at Haythorns, I was hired on as a cowboy. Okay. Um, at first, yep. And so I showed up, I left Robbie's. I think it was in May when I headed up there to Haythorns. Um, got up there, and they cut me a string of 18, I think there's like 18 three-year-olds that had 10 rides on them. And then that was my string of horses to brand on. And so I just spent that first couple weeks, I was there just getting those horses a little more broke so we could go out and use them. And, um, and just kind of, that kind of started a couple of those horses I ended up showing in the cow horse maturities. And, yeah. Uh, and a little ranch horse stuff and, and stuff like that. Tell me about those guys um, at, at Haythorns, because I, I, you know, I see these Sage and uh, those guys at different shows, and they seem like just salt of the earth people. Mm-hmm. You know, just how was it to work with those guys? Yeah, they they were great. That was probably the most fun I've ever had working. Um, there was a crew of us that were all about the same age. I mean, we worked our tails off. We played hard. I mean, in same thing, the Haythorns were great people. Um, they're still like family to me. Heck, we <laughs> ride colts for them every once in a while. Heck, last spring they needed help on the ranch rodeo team, so I went with them guys. And um, I'll take some of their Corini calves in the winter time, and we cut on them and kind of get them gentled in for them. And, I mean, like say they're here, or I go over there as much as we can, and yeah, they're they're really good people. That's cool, man. I I love to see Sage rope anything. <laughs> that guy yeah, is impressive, yes. man. I mean, can <laughs> rack it on them now. Yeah, and tight. <laughs> that's that's what that's exactly it. that was. It was always fun rodeoing with them guys because when you're the weakest link, you're like, okay, that's perfect. Them guys, <laughs> them guys are way better ropers than I am. <laughs> That's great. Are you doing much of that? Are you are you still doing some ranch rodeos? 
Now that- no, oh, every once in a while we'll piddle, but no, not much. We stay so busy showing now and yeah. kind of have to stay more business oriented and and uh, go that route. Oh, we we try to rope quite a bit yet, and like I said, we roped a few yearlings this morning just for sport and not three year olds and. Um, we team roped last night on a few. So yeah, we still, we still play. They work some, um, uh, Silver Spur has a bunch of country up around us here. So we'll go help them cowboys and they come over here and rope some a part of it, but don't go to town much for the, the ranch rodeo stuff anymore. So, so you leave Haythorn and you, you go directly to Wagon Hound after that? Mm. Yep, yep, I left Hathorns and, and yep, went up to Wagon Hill. I took a road trip, uh, I don't know, three years ago or so, and um, I was up in Wyoming and Montana and cruising through Colorado, but I, I stopped in at Wagon Hound, and man, that place, that arena, the, the yeah. indoor is unreal, like nothing I've ever seen before. Yeah, 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 it's like Cowboy's Paradise up there. Yeah, and in the yeah, middle of was, nowhere. It was Yes, exactly. Yeah, uh, you're dang sure off the beaten path. <laughs> I learned a lesson yeah. though. I, I, you know, I hadn't driven through any of that country before. Damn near ran out of gas um, because that's <laughs> just that far. You know, between gas stations, I uh, had no idea. But, but yeah, I was yep. impressed. No, how that's so how, exactly. If you go ahead. Yeah, I said no. If you get under a half a tank, you better be starting looking. Hell yeah. That part. <laughs> Yeah. What? Uh, how, how many years were you up there? I think I was there for almost four years. And then you just made the decision, you, you and your wife just made the decision to, to branch out on your own because you didn't want to be just a horse trainer working for somebody else. I mean, you kind of wanted to build something that you own and have your name behind, right? Yeah, no, it just kind of seemed like it was time to, to go ahead and take another the next step and that seemed like was what it was and so yeah we just took the plunge can you talk me talk to me a little bit about maybe the first time you realized that you wanted to do this as a profession and how you knew that you had that ability i mean i guess that's two different questions i guess first you know when did yeah. you, when did you have that inclination that this was the road you wanted to go down I guess it was probably when I was at Haythorns and stuff when like ranch rodeoing with them and showing in the ranch horse stuff and, and having some success, you know, and, and people telling you how good your horses looked and, and this and that. And I guess it just kind of like, well, shoot, maybe, maybe this is something the guy should look into. And, and like, they always liked having like going to town or whatever on them horses and, and somebody saying, Hey, that's a nice horse or this and that, or they'd, like go where you point them and I mean, you just feel like you can go do anything on them so um i guess that was kind of the start of it all and what about what about um like the first time you rode in as an open open level rider can you talk about like some of the mindset stuff or some of maybe the fears or what was it that gave you that confidence to push on through there I said when I bought when I had blue blood I bought him as a two year old and trained him and had him this that three year old year um, and I was so ignorant I didn't even know what I had I mean nobody told me how good a horse that was really everybody just let me do my deal and he'd show up in horse shows and next thing you know I was marking seventy twos and threes and across the board and I'm like holy cow how did i mean how did that happen like i I mean i was so green and had no idea what the heck i was even doing most of the time so i i don't think i even had any expectations of doing well right um i was just going out there and and just like well see how heck i wonder if i can do this (laughs) um and then just had good friends along the way helping me out i mean chris dawson was there from the very beginning and uh brad lunn and those guys and so like I say, it just kind of, that would help your confidence, I guess. And just having guys that would be successful in your corner. Right. I think that's, a, you know, a good point you made. Sometimes when we're naive to the situation and, and just go do it, you know, we're able to achieve a lot more than after we've been doing it a while. And then the expectations come, or once you've done that, you, you feel this pressure to do that again or do that better. Mm-hmm. 
you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, like I say, it's, it's a lot of work to, to get to that open, that top 20 riders list, and, mm-hmm. but it's even more work. It seems like to stay there. I see. How many hours, how many hours are you working a day right now, Matt? Oh, so I get up, I mean, we get up around five, five o'clock usually. And then I serve the crew breakfast every morning. Yeah. I heard um, that. So you so get up and cook every huh? morning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so I cook everybody breakfast. Breakfast is served at 6. Um, so everybody comes to the house. They feed, and then they'll come up to the house, and we'll all eat. And then we come back down to the barn about 6.30, a little after, and then we all pitch in and clean stalls. And then I usually get horseback about 7.30, I guess, is probably when I get on my first one. Uh-huh. Um, and then I just work straight through the day. Uh, my wife will bring me a sandwich or something at 1 o'clock or so whenever Oliver gets up from his nap. And But I usually get my last one worked at about 4.30 or 5 o'clock. How many are you riding? Oh, in, in it any depends. given day? I mean, probably, yeah. I mean, I probably had an average 20. Is what I'll work. Um, what 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 are those right like, now? Are they mainly three year olds. Yeah. So like this morning, I worked eight or nine three year olds, and then since we don't have any shows, um, I didn't ride any show horses. But I've been riding a bunch. I've got, I think, eight or nine two year olds. I'm riding also. So I'll ride a bunch of them, and then like yesterday, we came roped. I roped on two or three. I'm curious to know though, with with the you you somewhat alluded to it, the COVID nineteen right now. How has that impacted you, your business? You know the the show world. Yeah. So the toughest part is is not having any shows to go to. So we've got a sh- pretty good thing of show horses right now with nowhere to go with them. Um. And so, like, the hardest thing, like, business-wise is your trucks and trailers aren't making you any money. Right. Um, and so, that stuff's sitting there. Um, and But, like, our show horses, so we're just, I mean, I've got my help riding them outside in the pasture every day, or we'll rope the hot heels on them once or twice a week, or been roping on them. So, we're keeping them in shape and stuff like that. Um, but like I say, it's, it's pretty hard to keep motivated to ride those when there's no place to go with them right yeah i mean um especially what about i mean like horses you're trying to get money earned on you know i mean yeah the five-year-old derby horses are just taking a hit yeah um like i've got one that's a really good horse and he was green and we're just now getting him caught up well he's five well heck he's gonna miss half the shows this year yeah um if not all i guess it just depends but but yeah, no, that's that's the toughest thing getting getting earnings on these horses that need to be, I mean, mares and and studs, so that their offspring's worth more, or, or you know, people right. wanting to buy them, you know. Yeah. And um, we've lost a couple horses that people have had to kind of pull, you know, just because they don't know what's going to happen. Um, everybody's been pretty understanding. Um, I've tried to talk to most of them and 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 help them if we can, you know, in some spots and. Um, so what I did is when I first, this first came out, um, and they said we weren't going to have any shows here for a couple months or whatever, I got on the phone and, and called a bunch of guys that had, had ranch colts that needed started or whatever. So I've got a bunch of those horses coming in to kind of help subsidize our, our income at the moment. So we're riding, I don't, there's another half, extra half a dozen 30 and 60 day horses around here that are just, I mean, we're helping those people out by getting them started and then it's helping us out where we can keep some extra income coming in. Yeah. I think that's the, the, the only way to look at something like this, you know, it's totally out of anybody's control. So you just look for the mm-hmm. opportunities. I mean, it's our choice to find the, be negative about it and, and sit and bitch, or we can look for opportunities and and use it as, you know, something to grow and, and learn from. Yeah. Think outside the box there. Yeah, no, I went up and I bought a bunch of continuous fence the other day. So, I mean, if we end up having some spare time, we can, we can build a fence. <laughs> there you go. Get caught up on some projects. and. <laughs> what is your setup like out there, yeah. Matt, in Elizabeth? How many folks do you have on staff? Um, so I've got, right now I've got three full-time employees and then uh brianna she helps in the morning clean stalls and stuff a little bit um and like i say everybody lives right here on site we've got a bunkhouse and that they live in and then we've got the main house we live in 
Um, so it works out pretty good. We're able to kind of just stay in our own little world out here. Yeah. Quarantined up. Quarantined up. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it. People come in and drop horses off and out they go. Yeah, that's great. Well, I was going to ask that, um, you know, how you balance the show, the show world, training horses with family. But what it sounds like is it's somewhat blended together. Like it's all kind of mixed mm-hmm. in. It is. Yeah, I'm, yeah, we're pretty lucky and I mean, we both enjoy Brianna. She likes, to, she shows some too. And so she, she'll ride around and, um, all of her, he really enjoys coming to the barn and heck he comes down every morning. It's only two and a half, but he helps us clean stalls every morning. And, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, so he's got his own stall fork and he <laughs> comes in them stalls and then darn horses in studs. They love him. I mean, he plays with them. He'll, knock them around with that stall fork and they just look at him and <laughs> on him some more and... desensitization <laughs> oh man it's hilarious they'll mess they'll play with each other and he'll be hugging on their heads and yeah <laughs> yeah no so it works it works pretty well for us well that's cool well, man it sounds like um i mean you're still ticking along you know doing your thing and i think that's great um so i've got some ranch ponies you got some show ponies um, my question is, do you have a ranch on your show ponies? Yeah, so, well, I mean, I don't do it as much as I used to, um, but everything here gets roped on. I mean, if we've got, I mean, if we keep about 100 to 150 head of cutting cattle around all the time. So if something, like this morning we had to do a peanut pie, and heck, we were on two over security horses, and you just go over and jerk the rope down and build to them and either – we were just in the outdoors, so we just did it in there when we've seen them. But heck, we use them outside if we have to or whatever else. Yeah, they just still get treated just like horses. Do you think? Uh, do you think people that are in the show world may baby those those ponies sometimes too much or not expose them to? Or do you see a benefit in exposing those those horses to a little bit of everything? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I always thought, yeah, they really benefited from it. But honestly, I think we benefit from it just as much as they do. <laughs> yeah. Where we just go use them. We don't worry about them being correct. Just go ride them. And I think that helps us just kind of stay out of their way. And then in return, they just kind of relax a little bit more. Um, and so, like I say, we try to, like on the days we're not working them, try to go ride them out in the pastures and or down through the canyon and um, just get them out and do something different. But like I said, I think it helps helps our mind as much as theirs just because we don't feel like we have to pick on them that day. I've never heard it quite said like that, but that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of sense. Well, I think last, last week there was two days the arena was still wet outside and I'd about had enough of this indoor, so I just threw loping hackamores on all my three-year-olds and I'd trot and loped them a half mile down the road and rode them through a canyon for about a quarter mile and came back and i did that on all nine of them that's great i, mean, <laughs> I didn't pick i didn't kick i didn't do i just I just went and got along <laughs> that's great how are you how do you start those two-year-olds are you putting all of them in a hackamore right out of the gate or snaffle no we just use um just a halter we'll ride them in a halter for three or four days right and then we just put a, a snaffle on them um, just pretty cut and dry and simple. Just make sure you pull them left, pull them right, and go from there. You know, it's you have had a lot of success, and it seems like you've had a lot of success very quickly. But after hearing your story, it's like your whole life you've kind of been building up to this whole thing. Um, mm. you know, towards I mean, mm. four time AQHA champion. You've been, you know, snaffle bit. Yeah. Um, what were you, fifth and sixth in the snaffle bit in 2019? Six mm-hmm. of the world's greatest in 19. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Just as, you know, people think, you know, they see somebody that may have made it like yourself and they're like, oh, well, he just, you know, he's just lucky or he's just naturally good. Or yeah. can you talk about the grind and the, the, the work that went into it way before anybody knew who Matt Cook was? Yeah, yeah, and that's what I, I mean, I've told people in the past and stuff. I mean, everything I've done has been, I mean, to get to this point. And I didn't even know this was the point I wanted to be at. But every, like, 
I've made a living or everything I've owned or whatever else has come from being horseback or horse related. I mean, whether it's just cowboying or riding Bronx or shoeing or, I mean, whatever, I've just been really fortunate and just have always wanted to be a part of this lifestyle. I mean, it's just kind of, and it's kind of given back to me now. It's pretty crazy. I look back at last year, how much money I won and, or even at the snaffle bit. And I'm like, holy cow, I didn't even, I never would have guessed that I could have won, made that much money showing horses. <laughs> <laughs> that's great right i mean that's i think everybody's goal is to do what you love to do and get paid very well to do it yeah yeah like i say there's there's way easier ways to make a living but yeah like i say this is just something i i chose to do and it just seems to seem to be working so one of the questions i have to hear is if somebody were to come to you today and say matt here's a hundred million dollars or any amount of money that you don't have to work another day in your life what do you do tomorrow? <laughs> buy a ranch. <laughs> you already got one of those, right? You just buy a bigger one? <laughs> That's it, yeah. We'll just buy some more country around here. Turn out more yearlings in the summertime yeah. and try to ride less horses. <laughs> just, we would still probably work exactly the same. <laughs> probably still be showing, I would assume. Yeah, I would sure think so, yep. Just That's maybe exactly pick and choose it. which ones you would go to. Yep, yep. Maybe have fancier tractors or ski boaters or stuff like that. So when a guy wants to do projects, he can just simplify it. Yeah. <laughs> have a nice welding rig or... Yeah, yeah. You are kind of a jack-of-all-trades. Yeah. I, I heard, I, I learned that um, through that last podcast was you do a little bit of welding too? Or, or, yeah, or pretty so good at it. I don't want to. I, mean, I don't want to understate that. I mean, it sounds like you're pretty damn good at it. <laughs> That's a no. I've just been, like I say, I've been fortunate and, and grew up having to do a bunch of that stuff, and um, and just have the ability to do it. And like I say, it sure helps out. I and mean, we've built. I mean, the indoor and the stall barn was here, and the houses, but like all our outside facilities, I've built. I mean, all our feedlot pens, arenas. Um all our two-year-old pins and so no that's kind of like when i get kind of bored with the like had enough horse training for a while i'll just like say we'll start a project and, and go weld and and stuff like that like last weekend we put in about i don't know what we put in 400 foot of continuous fence probably along the driveway Damn. had a nice change of pace for a couple days yeah just to kind of break up the routine a little bit Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so like I say, I, I kinda enjoy welding and, and designing corrals and stuff that. So it's been been fun getting to build build everything and see how it turns out. And if you don't like it, heck you tear it out and go again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well I'm curious to know I don't know if the guys that do what work for me like it quite as much as <laughs> I don't know if the guys that work for me quite like it quite as much as I do, but they yeah. play along. Yeah. <laughs> what is um so I'm curious to know this answer, Matt, and ask I'm curious to know this from anybody who has, has done something at the level that you're you're at. Um what is your why? You know, what is it that makes you get up? Because that that's not easy. I mean you, you got you guys are working long hours, the, the work's tough, everything that you guys do is expensive. So you have to have a strong why behind what you do and really know your purpose. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I don't know what the, I mean, I guess we're too hard-headed to quit. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, quitting is not an option. So you just, every day you're like, all right, I want to see if I can get a day and a half worth of work done in a day. Yeah. Is it? it and I don't, I'm just always been that way and they're like okay how many horses can i get rode today mm -hmm. can we make them are they going to be better than yesterday or i mean yeah and then like so you just want to have as many good horses as you can is it about is it about maxing that horse out to the best of his ability or is it maxing out your abilities you know to the best that they can be or maybe maybe a little bit of both I think it's probably some of both. Um, and for me, it's just finding where the horse can shine. 
um, like I said, trying to get the most of it out of its natural ability as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, whether that's to run and slide farther than anything else you have in the barn or go down the fence better than the rest of them. Um, so like in my mind every day, like today I went down the fence on all my three-year-olds and we kind of had a competition between all them three-year-olds. Okay. Which three-year-old won today? Mm. Um, and so it's fun to see how they change. Like yesterday, one won the fence work today, a different one won the fence work. (laughs) <laughs> that's great. Um, and so I think that's kind of, you play that in your mind, or I do, and like I say, it just kind of gets you to keep you going, okay, which one of these horses is going to be the next superstar, if any of them? Right. At what point do you know that answer? Oh. When, and and, when and, and what I, let me, board. let me, let me <laughs> give some context around that. At what point do you feel good enough to say, okay, I'm taking this one to the snaffle bit. I feel like he he's the one. At what point does that cross your mind? Yeah, I don't know. Like last year, the horse I was fifth on, I was like, oh my goodness, what am I doing taking this thing down here? <laughs> like I, um, <laughs> he's a great horse, but like he was throwing some tricks at me, and like I was puzzled. I'm like, holy cow. And then he gets down there and he shines. I mean, all his, I mean, he comes to the surface and comes to play. And so, I mean, you can tell pretty early if they've got enough talent um, to kind of stick with no, but then you'll have some that aren't quite as talented, but have a better mind and let you show them harder. Uh Um, And so it's, it's a darn guessing game. I mean, you just got to be honest with yourself and with your clients. Right. Um, and that seems to be the, the best way to go about it. Like, like I always tell them all, I said, I don't want to waste my time or your money. Right. So if something's giving me an uneasy feeling or I don't, I think we've top, topped him out in this event, we either need to find something else he's going to excel at or, I mean, or somebody else that might get along with him. Right. But yeah. So, so yeah, you never, you never know. Um, I'm curious to know you mentioned that about playing the game. I'm assuming that was just a game like with you and your horses. Um, will you do that sometimes, kind of have like a visualization, you know, almost like kids playing wiffle ball, you know, they're picturing themselves at Fenway or having these little games that they play. I mean, are you are you doing that um, with these ponies as you, as you get them ready to go show? Yeah, so like, I mean, if, like, if you kick a cow out, like say today on them three-year-olds, if I kick the cow out, and this horse is dialed in in that boxing, I'm like, all right, game on. Let's just see what we got here. Yeah. And I'll go make a pretend run. And and until, like, stuff, the wheels fall off or something, or I feel like I need to kind of pick him up. But, yeah, I mean, heck, yeah, we've got these things trained. We might as well have fun on them. <laughs> That's I mean, great. We've got these, <laughs> these souped-up ranch horses. We might as well treat them like sports cars and it on every once in a while and like i say i mean if that's what helps kind of keep them horses quiet and them show pins a little bit more it's, i mean it's no big deal to them they're used to getting that way at home and like i say if, if something's out of whack we'll fix it if it all feels good and the cow's outstanding heck i'm gonna go ahead and go enjoy myself <laughs> that's great <laughs> speaking of enjoying yourself during the uh, i wanted to make sure i brought this up during, during the, um, the world's greatest last year during the fence work, they blow the whistle. Will you ever stop if they ever if they blow the whistle? And so, for, for people that may be listening that don't know, if, if when they turn a cow out, if the cow's too wild or rank, they'll blow the whistle and give you the option to choose another cow. My man Matt just kept at it, man. He wasn't stopping, and I thought yes, it was but- great. Crowd goes wild. Well, yeah, I don't really. People ask me why I did that. I have no idea, really. <laughs> You gained a lot of fans by doing that. I know that is a fact. Yeah, that's it. Well, that mare, I own the mare, and I know, I mean, I've had that mare from the very beginning, so I know her inside and out, and she was hooked to that cow. I mean, she had it red and was fixing it, and I was like, and they blow that whistle, and I'm like, eh, let's just see what happens. (laughs) This is what the cow god sent. (laughs) I got gotcha. you. Gotcha. Oh, and it was close. I mean, if that dirt cow would have took that second turn, who knows what would have happened. Yeah, man. That, no kidding. But No kidding. No, I mean, heck. So that was in the moment. That's not. That's, it was. 
That's not something you're going to continue yeah, it to was, do. Like it went through my mind. Yeah, it went through my mind to pull up. You know, I'm like, no, this mare feels pretty good. Let's just see. <laughs> and so, like I say, shit, we're here. We might as well have fun. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it, man. I thought it was great. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's what I say. When you ride out the back gate and your buddies are like, you are a dumb son of a <laughs> I can hear they call me, but... <laughs> But they were laughing. They we all had a grand old time with it. Yeah. <laughs> so like I say, heck, I I wasn't even really like I say when I left with that mare. That was my wife's horse. I showed. And heck, we more or less just gathered her out of the pasture and got her legged up to enter. We weren't even really expecting to make the finals. I just wanted something to show down there. So right. Heck, it was all just like, well, heck, we're here. We might as well just see what happened. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about your pregame, Matt. You know, I'm a, I'm a baseball guy, so pregame was a big deal to me. I was very superstitious, as most baseball players are. Do you have a ritual, a routine, or anything you do, like either, you know, that morning or right before the show or, you know, when you're sitting on deck in that tunnel waiting to go out, what's kind of what's going through your mind? No, I mean, you just want to be kind of focused, you know, and try not to have too many interruptions, just kind of, like I say, kind of be in your little world. I mean, not necessarily in your own little world, but, I mean, take it serious, but don't get so worked up about it. You just kind of forget to breathe. And, um, like, for me, the main thing is try to make sure uh, those horses are, are happy um, before you go in there so that you know they're going to be on your side mm-hmm. as much as possible. Um, so when you do get into certain situations, especially in the fence work, they're there to help you out um, and not be worried by the situation. Gotcha. And I just threw about um, four questions at you at one time. <laughs> so <laughs> let me back up. Let me back up. So let's go to like the day you wake up. It's show day. What does that day look look like for you? I mean, mentally, what are you doing? Are you eating a certain thing? Are you doing a certain routine? No, heck no. I don't have that many smarts to remember all that stuff. So I just get up normal. Heck, I'll go, and depends on what help I have at the, stall, at the barn or at the show, if I have clean stalls or whatever else. Or, um, like I say, I may go watch a few runs if it's the cow work, just see how the cattle look. Um, but just kind of, like I said, try to stay as mentally stable as you can and just don't do anything out of the ordinary, um, especially like the rain work days. Uh, that morning, if you go rain on them before the show starts or whatever, don't like what I tell a lot of people is, or young guys, um, don't fall in the trap of watching some, do something there. Um, and I'm up in it. Think you need to do it. Right. Um, like I'll try, like say, just try to stick to your plan and, and your program and, and just let it happen. What percentage would you say when you get to that show, what percentage is the horse and then what percentage is you riding? Oh, it depends on the horse, probably. Um, and sometimes they'll surprise you. Um, like I say, you just, like for me, I just want to try to be on the same same playing field with them. I mean, same mindset or whatever else. Like I say, I want them to be trying to help me, and I want to have them prepared where I can help them. So if they get themselves in a bind, I can get them out of it. If I may misread a situation, they can help me out. Mm-hmm. Um and like I say, so I don't know if it'd be 50-50 or 60-40. I, I don't really know. I mean, like I say, I just I would hope we're on the out there to try to do the same thing. Talk to me a little bit about, because you've been training horses your, your whole life and, and, and you've grown up around that world. What did it take or how did you learn the business side of, of what you do? I guess it's from working, like growing up the way we grew up. Um, my family has a big cabinet shop, so I was always kind of involved with some business there. Um, not just hands-on, but just seeing it from the outside. Um, and then working for guys that just had good, I mean, just good good people. I mean, like the Haythorns and stuff like that, that just taught you the ethics of it all, I guess it would be. I mean, you just tell somebody the way you think it the way you expect it to be and you hope they expect it to be the same way and you just stay up front with people 
right. um, seems to be the best way to handle things for us. Um, like when they send the horse here, when it shows up here, I just treat it exactly as it was my own. I mean, I don't try to overdo stuff with them or if they need that work. I'll work on them. If they don't, if they're, if they feel fine, we just roll on with it. I mean, um, shoeing, we just, like I say, we just take care of them like they're, they're our own. Yeah, I don't think you can ever go wrong by being genuine and actually, I mean, just doing the right thing, as simple as that sounds. Um, a lot of folks yeah. aren't doing that, you know, so, and that's in any field, not well, just the horse world. That's it's easier, field. yeah, <laughs> it's easier said than done because you don't really want to upset people, you know, and you're afraid to tell them, hey, your horse ain't good enough for this and that because, I mean, some people, yeah, they, they'll get upset by it, but like I said before, I, mean, I want to tell them, hey, I don't want to waste my time or your money. I mean, right. they both are very valuable. Right. And that goes um, a long way, like you know. Just kinda, you never know what they may bring yes. you down the road. or. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think... I think. Yeah, no. And then that's, with again, that's, with anything, that's people and, and the relationship. And just, I think, be, by being honest and having that open communication, man, you can't go mm-hmm. wrong with it. Even yep. if that person does not want to hear yep. it, you can't. Yeah, you can't go wrong by doing that. Yep, that's exactly it. And like I say, sometimes it'll get you in trouble, but like I say, in the end, I think it's a better way to go. And but we've been really fortunate and, and always have plenty of horses to ride and stuff like that. And um, and so like I, I mean, it's not like we've ever just needed horses so we had something to ride. I mean, we're always plenty busy, but. Um, but yeah, it's just get up front with people and have no gray area. I mean, it's just like kind of training a horse, really. I mean, if you just keep it black and white for them horses, they don't seem to be near as confused. Right. And be consistent with that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, from what little bit about I, I know about you, Matt, it seems like you do Matt Cook very well. You know, you avoid the comparison game with what so-and-so may be doing or... <laughs> You know, especially like you just mentioned, mm. going to a show for some of those non-pros and looking at what somebody else is doing and and just staying yeah. with what you know, you know. Um, I heard somebody say the other day, don't compare your chapter one to somebody else's chapter 20. How have yeah. you been able to stay so true to that? Um, I think it was just kind of my foundation there, too. I mean, starting showing some of the horses I showed um, – like there at Haythorns and Big Ranch horses. I mean, heck, that one Blue Roan horse I showed, he was 16 hands and weighed 1,300 probably. I mean, he physically Jesus. could not do what these other horses do. How was he bred? Um, So you just, he was a Snickle Fritz checks on the top side and, uh, goodness gracious, what was he on the bottom? I can't even remember what he was. But he was, uh, that's the horse I ranch rodeoed on and stuff. And I, I didn't win a lot on him, but I bet I won almost 5000 on him in the cow horse deal. Really? And like I said, that was Did one of my first in, in a hackamore. Yeah, I had steers on him and rode him in a hackamore all the time when he was four and five. Really? Yeah, he was a great horse, yeah. You headed on him in a hackamore? Yep, actually, I... Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Yep, I'd had and I'd ranch rodeo on him in the Hackamore. That's great. <laughs> yeah, we'd pick Bronx up on him, and I mean everything. Like I say, I showed him in the limited open Hackamore, and I mean the Derby stuff, and then I showed him some in the two rain. But yeah, he was a he was a good good horse. Yeah, but yeah, that was kind of one of my first one of my first show horses there too. So like I said, kind of learned like I just learned how to ride them for what they were. And I think that's just kind of, kind of just kept with me. Right. Does that make you appreciate what you have now? Those the the ones you have coming in now, versus some of some of those yeah, earlier ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's exactly it. But even like the really good bred horses, even still, I mean, you still got to keep a pretty open mind on them. Um, it's like I mean, I've got some that got a ton of bend and a ton of style, and then I've got some that don't want to bend at all, but yet you can still get them to go do their job. Right. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's kind of the, the main thing for me is just get them where they are a functioning tool. Tell me this, Matt. If you had advice for any, like, kids starting out, um, 
maybe wanting to go down the same path that, that you went down, what advice would that be? You better like to work. <laughs> um, so I, I've just always tried to keep in the mindset, I don't want to be the weakest link. Um, whether you're building fence, you're sweeping the barn, you're cleaning stalls. I mean, every day, no matter what I'm doing, like say when we're cleaning stalls in the morning, I see if I can clean more stalls than the other guys faster. <laughs> Everything's a competition. Uh, just, yeah. I mean, and it's nothing real spectacular here, but like I say, it just keeps you moving forward. Mm-hmm. And like I say, and, and people notice that stuff. I mean, go the extra distance. Like, keeping something clean or asking somebody if they need help or, or whatever. I mean, just, I mean, just like guys on the ranch would, you know, I mean, if you see somebody struggling, jump in there and help them out. Seems to be a consistent trend with you. I mean, just do, just do what's right. You know? Yeah. I mean, you just keep it simple. I say it, 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 for me, it pertains to the horse training in the same exact way. The simpler you can keep it on these things, the, the easier it seems to be on them. Yeah. So does that, where does that come from though, Matt? I mean, that, that trait, that personality, I mean, does that come from your folks back home? Um, is that something you've developed um, throughout your career just from being around I other I'm. Yeah, I'm sure it, I mean, it starts out growing up and stuff. I mean, we, we worked hard growing up. I mean, we, I mean, on the day we were cutting firewood and working and doing this and that and, um, it was just kind of a part of it. And then, like I say, I've been fortunate to places I've worked that they had kind of the same, the same work ethic. And so I just, I've just never known any different. Well, it definitely, it definitely shows, you know, I mean, your resume proves that, you know, um, I think any success there, there is no fast track. There is no hack to success. You know, it comes after no. hours, days, years of, of hard, consistent work, you know, and that's anybody that I've sat down with so far, there's, there's a trend there, you know, and it's this long journey yeah. of getting, getting to those successes. And that's not the end of it. I mean, we don't, we don't, you don't go win the snaffle yeah. bit and say, well, I'm, you know, I can hang it up now. I'm done. No, it's all those days yeah. and hours that you put in that, that is the journey, you know? Yep. Nope. That. And then it's just like, say, just surrounding your people or surrounding yourself with people that, I mean, that are just good for your mental stability. I mean, when it comes to this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, just trying to stay positive and, and just knowing you've got guys in your corner. Yeah. That, that's a very good point too. You know, they say you are the sum of the five people you surround yourself with. And I think that is a very true statement. Yep. So, um, yeah, and then, like I say, and then just trying to do that back to, and give that back to others too, if, if possible. So, are you doing it? Speaking of giving it back, are you? Are you, do you have anybody that that is at your place now, or that you've apprenticed along the way? Um, you know that you may be teaching the Matt Cook of you know whenever you were twenty five. Are you teaching somebody else along that same journey? Yeah, I mean, so all the guys that come through here, you, I try to help them out as much as I can, um, and they'll get as much out of it as, as they want to get, you know. Um, like right now, I've got a kid named Matt Frederick um, that's working for me again. Um, he worked for me at Wagon Helm for two years, and then he went out on his own some. And then he was kind of training out of the barn here last year, and then I talked him into kind of coming to, I mean, work for me full time. And so, yeah, I've been trying to help him, and He's getting to show some more and, um, and riding a bunch of my two-year-olds and I gave him a few three-year-olds. And so, yeah, we just kind of work side by side and, um, just help each other out. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. And I I think that's great. I think that, you know, I'm in real, I'm a real estate investor by day. That's what I do. And when I really started learning, um, was when I started teaching the stuff that I'd been, you know, diving into yeah. and, and that's when you because einstein has a quote that says if you can't explain it simply you don't understand it well enough and and it does get frustrating from time to time because like i have heck explaining a lot of i mean some of these things um well a lot of it's feel right in a your, lot of it in your world it's yeah feel. and it hadn't been yeah and i and i've just lucked out and like nobody's explained some of it to me i've just kind of figured it out you know from trial and error and experience and and so trying to pass that on sometimes will get a little frustrating between you and your help. And 
but you both know that hey you're you're trying this for the the good and i think that's all you can do you know is do your best to, to the highest potential you have and the outcome is going to be what it is and that doesn't matter that, that, you know whether you're teaching yeah. somebody or at a show or or whatever it may be in business or that's something i've i've struggled yep. with is letting go of the outcome you know just do do my best yep. and, and because i'm a very competitive mm-hmm. person you know and so that's yep. been a struggle yep. for me talk about um let's talk about horses a little bit um stp blue blood Talk a little bit about him, and and uh, I didn't realize he was such a big horse because he doesn't he he moves yeah. around. I mean, he's an athletic cat, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, I I don't know how I lucked out with that horse. I mean, everything I have, I mean, I've got probably because of that horse. I mean, he helped me learn how to show. He helped me. I mean, win my first, however many thousands of dollars i mean he just just i just lucked out and he somehow we um yeah he was just a i mean just a good horse we i had him on that hay farm and so we we used him quite a bit and i mean like i said i didn't even know what i had half the time underneath me he just kind of <laughs> bailed me out when i put him in bad situations and yeah. away we went but you were <clears throat> you bought him at an auction right I bought a snaffle bit sale as a two-year-old. Yeah, what was it that drew yeah, you to him, yeah. though? He was a big, soggy, I mean, just a big, raw-boned roan horse. Yeah. I thought, well, hell, if he doesn't make a show horse, I can sell him as a ranch guild. And so I more or less bought him just as a trader. I mean, hmm. I didn't even really know what he was bred. I mean, I just looked, and he was like, yeah, that one looks okay. You know, he'll work. <laughs> and then like see i got him home he had fall works at fall and i pulled his shoes off and i just used him for them fall works and i mean a calf or something would try to squirt by and i mean this big son of a gun would jump over there and stop it and crawl on his belly and i'm like what in the world <laughs> is this and like i say hell i never rode anything close to like that that big and strong and so like i'm like well, hell, this there ain't nothing to this horse training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so two, and then two AQHA world champions and 118 over 118,000 lifetime earnings later. Yeah, off of just a big roan ranch horse. Yeah, that's great, man. That's great. And that's something I've learned, you know, just from talking with other folks on the show too is how much that those horses like that can teach us you know or teach the folks mm-hmm. that are training yeah no it was just like i say he i I'd mess up and he'd just he'd bail me out and, and so like it was like i said just the confidence builder and you right. thought well heck i i do belong here <laughs> that's cool man <laughs> well um matt i'll got some i usually do like five rapid fires but I, i've got quite a few here um I'm going to, I'm going to kind of roll through some of these things. Um, yeah, this is a long list. <laughs> if you get tired of answering them, just let me know. So, um, favorite bit maker for my snaffles or Dennis Moreland. What do you prefer to ride? Would you rather, would you rather ride in a hackamore or, um, in a bit? It just depends on those horses. Um, yep. So, uh, it's, Right now, I think everything's put on a hack more except one. I mean, that I've got. Um, same thing with them five year olds. I mean, like I say, it just kind of depends on, on whether they, they're a hack or horse or, or they just like that snaffle. I got you. All right. What about saddles? What are you riding? Uh, Tad Sanders, uh, ranch cutters. Gotcha. If you had. If somebody said, Matt, you can only go to one more show the rest of your life, what show would that be? Oh, my. Oh, I guess it would depend on what I had in the barn to go show. (laughs) If I had a a really good bridle horse, well, heck, world's greatest. If I had a really good three-year-old snaffle bitter, well, snaffle bit for charity. Yeah, 
I got you. Or if I had a really good hackamore horse, the hackamore tactic. Let's say you had all of it, all of it. Any any one of the those three. Could you, you got all your bullets? Yeah, you got um, all the bullets. She so like for me the snaffle bit and the world's greatest are right there, pretty close. I mean, I don't know if I could pick one or the other. Yeah, what is it that you like um, about those shows, Matt? Uh, like the maturity, the snaffle bit. You just never know. I mean, with when them colts are gonna peak, mm-hmm. um, and the crowd and and all that. I mean, it, it's just the last few years showing the finals there in Fort Worth is just. I mean, it's like going to a rock concert. It's, it's intense, more dang right? fun in there. <laughs> oh man, yeah, it's like that fence work is. I mean, I it is more dang fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then just and then. With the world's greatest, I mean, just the challenge of getting those bridal horses ready in four events. I mean, and your your skills and ability are about as equal to the horse's skills and ability. Um, having to get everything to align, you know. Right. Yeah, I've never, I haven't been to watch that yet. Um, of course, I watch it online, but I mean, they people that have been that I know say it's like nothing else they've ever seen, you know. So. I yeah, it's same thing. It. When you make those finals, yeah, when you make the finals there, I mean, it's it's quite the deal. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. Like last year on this Cat Sinful and that fence work, when I when they blew the whistle and I just rolled with it, I mean, I didn't even know what, like, people were standing up in a stand, and you're like, well, what <laughs> in the world are you supposed to do in this situation? <laughs> I mean, That's great. (laughs) I mean, it was wild. I mean, it's just a a feeling like you can't even explain. Yeah. Like I say, it's like, well, shoot. I mean, it's it's fun and exciting. I mean, it's what we do it for, I guess. Yeah. So kind of along those same lines, um, you know, because you mentioned how intense that show is. If you could, if you could choose the song that you show to, what song do you pick? Yeah, I mean, it's got to have something with some energy. To it. Just, I mean, it just adds to the fun and the energy, you know. So, yeah. So SDP Blue Blood. I mean, lifetime earnings, like we said, over one hundred eighteen thousand. Um, two AQHA World Champions, fourth at the World's Greatest. Describe him in one word. Shoot, just a good horse. I mean, <laughs> that, I mean that works. <laughs> that works. That's more than one yeah. word, but that works. Yeah. Um, tell me the. So, if you're not at a competition, like if you're not competing, who's a, who is the the favorite person you like to watch show? Oh heck, there's so many good guys. I mean. You've got to go with guys like Doug Williamson. That's I mean, just because he's still out there doing it. I mean, Todd Crawford's a blast. I mean, and then all your buddies, you know. I mean, heck, there's so many good riders and women out there. Heck, it, it's all fun to watch. I mean, it's to watch a good rider and a horse go around. I mean, heck. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't really matter who. Yeah. Okay. Um, this will be my, well, I got this one and then we'll have one, I'll have my last question for you. But, um, how many two-year-olds do you think you've started in your life? Oh, dear me. Uh, I bet I'd be close to a thousand. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't have a clue. I mean, there were some years I would start in a hundred of them just myself. Yeah, that's impressive. Um, I think we did almost 50 last year i mean what we're on this year already we're probably 25 this year already yeah thousand that's Um, impressive man yeah no yeah no it's i don't know how many things i've been things i've started (laughs) (laughs) more than a person should All right, last question, man, and I ask everybody that comes on the show this. You know, the name of the show is The Converse Cowboy. Um, what is your definition of a cowboy? Hmm. I guess just a good hand at doing whatever, whether it's, I mean, moving a set of cows outside or working a horse or, I mean, and then just 
being as good as person as you can. I mean, I mean, just kind of living the lifestyle. Um, I thought you were going to say Matt Cook. <laughs> yeah, Look no, up cowboy no, in the dictionary. You see Matt Cook. Myself that some days. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, cool, man. Well, Matt, look, I'm I'm very grateful for your time today. Um, I enjoyed the hell out of this, and uh, look forward to seeing you get back in the show pen. You know, if and when that time comes, you know, when the COVID nineteen dissipates and the smoke settles, and you guys can get back into yeah. what y'all do. Um, look forward to seeing you again. Yeah.